Mercedes Cruz Sandoval, and I started teaching at Miami Dade, right at this campus, where the action is, 42 years ago. Um, I'm a cultural historian, uh, an anthropologist, but I enjoy history very much. And I'm going to tell you something about the situation in 1960, when the events that we are going to discuss here took place. First of all, I want to recommend you something. Please take history courses, otherwise you are amnestic. And you live in the most important democracy the world has ever produced, and it is in danger. Because if the citizens are not informed, our democracy is in danger. You know where? No place in the world human live better than in Miami. You hear me? Or black Americans live better than in the United States. And I urge you to defend this democracy. Even though sometimes I have felt, you know, a little bit um, segregated, there is nothing compared to segregation here to what happened to me in Cuba. Somebody picks me up, put me in a helicopter in Havana, I will be in jail in two hours. You hear me? And remember this, you don't have human rights. Human rights are not universal. You don't have them in your DNA. Some societies give human rights to its citizens. Well, anyway, now I will start with 1960. 1960 is a crucial area because it was in the middle of the Cold War. Of course, if you don't know history, you don't know the, what the Cold War is. The last century, the 20th century, was a century that uh, we could say that is characterized by a very important ideological clashes. Ideological clashes are sort of a worldview, you know, that is tinged with political ideas of what the rule of the government should be like. On one side, you have the fascists, who are right-winger, oriented toward the past, and is better represented by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And on the other side, you had communism, you know, uh, primarily represented by the Soviet Union, which is the worst representative of anything that has to do with freedom. But anyway, that's another story. And that, those clashes uh, lasted practically um, until the end of the last century. It was unfortunate because it took away from mankind the time to take care of our environment and to take care of one of the major problems that mankind has, which is overpopulation. You follow what I'm trying to say? Well, the, and during World War II, fascism on one side and the democracy alongside with um, um, communism fought a war, and the war was lost by Germany. You all know that, I hope so, in 1945, okay? But then, right then and there, uh, there had been a deal to give to Russia part of Europe, which was a horrible mistake. And then it started what is called the Cold War, a confrontation without a war, a confrontation between the Soviet Union and its allies, and the so-called free world, which is the European nation and the United States as a leader. That happened in 1945, right? and it lasted until uh, the Reagan era, era around the 1980-something, when finally the Soviet Union changed. It was a time of great... Uh, imagine, um, I was, um, what, uh, eight, ten years old when the... Um, World War II took place, and at the time, at America, with all of its problems, like, like Churchill said, with all of its wrongs, is the most rightful place in the world. But anyway, um, if you bought a radio, it was American radio. If you bought a watch, it was an American watch. You know, we were um, supreme all over the world. And I'm not um, a, a right-winger, by the way. And I'm not one of the good old boys either. But anyway, um, um, th uh, it was a time of American supremacy, and then it was challenged by Russia. Uh, and by a dogmatism, you know what dogmatism is? I believe, in, you know, that captured the mind of many people because who doesn't want a better future for mankind? Who doesn't want so social justice? I want social justice, but what I have seen in my life has been Social revenge, 
<laughs> and when they have divided the, the goods of a country, you know, to give to the poor people, you know what happened? The upper class takes it all, and that's about the end of the game. And after what I saw and I studied in, 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 in Stalin, Russia, uh, Marxism is not the answer, you know? So it was a time of great ideological problem. In 1938, there was a treaty signed in Rio de Janeiro, the, um, Brazil. It was the capital of Brazil. And the American states, the people in this hemisphere, agreed that it would not be permitted to have a communist regime in the Americas. All right. It sounds great. Meanwhile, I am I, I'm born in Cuba. And the Cuban Republic was founded in 1902. It was not even 50 years old, and the whole troubles had started. For a republic that lasted 50 years old, it accomplished a lot. I don't care what they said. Excellent education. Cuba have Trump um, in Miami, not because of their millionaires. No, 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 no. Because the great teachers that we had in the island. I wish that we had them here. And I wish my, ch my children would have been trained by the teachers that I had. Okay. Then another, um, Cuba was an ally of the United States. In essence, we were dependent in the United States. And the United States had too much power in Cuba, and I clearly criticized that. I was a student at the University of Havana from 1950 to 55, and I was involved in every trouble there I was. Because I'm old now, but I was young, you know. I was a troublemaker. But anyway, I belong to the independent of Puerto Rican movement, and God is so merciful that I married a Puerto Rican and had a civil war with him who practically kill each other for 12 years. Then we went to live in Puerto Rico, and I found out that the only person that wanted independence of Puerto Rico was me. <laughs> the Puerto Rican family were all for uh, the status that they have right now. But anyway, what I'm trying to say, the, there was that confrontation between the West and um, and Stalin. Stalin killed more people, I don't know whether you know that, than Hitler. His own people. And I'm not saying that for propaganda's sake. Read a book called Gulag Archipelago. Gulag Archipelago. Gulag Archipelago. Read it. You know what? Because you want to make the right choices. Because you don't you cannot let this country down. I'm glad that this country is incorporating the experiences of other than the Anglo Saxons. Eh? But I don't see why they have to be separate. I want the story of the Hispanics in this country, which, by the way, we discovered. But anyway, that's another story. But to be integrated with the rest. And the same with the black people. You know, it's part of American history. Separation doesn't take us anywhere, make us weaker. But anyway, in that, in that situation comes the phenomenon in Cuba, coup d'etat, sponsored by an American company, but I don't want to get into that. And uh, a revolution against an illegitimate government. And then comes uh, the Robin Hood, according to New York Times, that is Fidel Castro. I know Castro from the University of Havana. Castro is a gangster. <laughs> a plain and simple, I know him very, very well. Okay. But anyway, in that situation, Castro takes power. And the word is spread that um, he's going to take the, um, the parents' right over their children. That had um, an impact on the mind of Cubans because Cubans, like all Latin and like blacks, the most important unit is the family. And they are afraid of that their children were going to be sent to Russia, like it happened in the Spanish Civil War, and afraid that they were going to be turned into communists and the parents wouldn't have any power over their children, which happened. They were forced to send them to the La Escuela de Campo, you know, and they established military services for the boys. Then it started this odyssey of the greater exodus in Cuban history. By the way, and this is my last word, Cuba was a country of immigrants. And since Castro got to power, had become a, a, a country of immigrants. Okay, uh, my personal experience as a Peter Pan, and I do not like that term, but I, I will use it, Pedro Pan, 
<clears throat> is intertwined with the truth about the real history about this event. <clears throat> First, I'll cover my personal experience so you get a, a feel of what it is for a human being to undergo what we went through. And finally, I will uh, share with you the real reason and why this movement uh, started. Um, Mid-December 1960, Christmas holidays from school. I'm at home. My parents leave the house to go to a meeting with Mr. James D. Baker, the principal of the, my school in Havana, Ruston Academy. And um, when they return home, my mother says to me, Celita, I was 17 years old. Celita, you have to leave uh, Cuba and go to the United States. I said, no, no, mother, no. I'm not going to leave alone. She says, no, you're not leaving alone. You have to take your eight-year-old brother with you. I said, oh, mother, no, we, we can't do that. Well, you must. Mr. Baker has informed us that the school and all private schools in Havana are going to be taken over by the government. So education will no longer be, you know, private or free or anything. And he has the means uh, by his contacts with the American embassy, the US government, and a contact he made in Miami to have you and your brother get your paperwork expedited and leave. So that was it. That was the end of that. We packed our suitcases. My brother, who was eight years old and had been hearing all this environment that Dr. Sandoval mentioned, which had the adults and all the families very excited and constantly talking about it. And people think children don't listen. Well, my eight-year-old brother said, I want to leave. And he didn't know what he was saying. We packed our bags. I got a brand new winter coat because we're coming to the north. It's going to be cold. So did my brother have a very nice little coat. And my mother, very foolishly, I don't know why she ever did this, sewed some money into the lining of her coat, of my brother's coat, because we were coming here. We had a lot of clothes, but we didn't have a cent. We were not allowed to bring any money. So fortunately, they didn't search my brother, and he got through. But as we left Cuba, I, I never forget this, and I really don't like talking about it very much, because just thinking about it makes me want to cry and feel very emotional about it. I'm holding my brother's hand, and he finally realizes what it means for him, an eight-year-old, to separate from his mother. And he started crying, something that I've never forgotten to this day. When we were at the, uh, when we arrived in Miami, we were then separated. He, he was holding to me, onto me for dear life, but at the airport we became separated because my brother went to live with a, an aunt of mine, my mother's sister, and I was picked up by Catholic Welfare Bureau representatives uh, to, to go to Assumption Academy, then an orphanage, then a boarding school in St. Augustine, Florida, where I did graduate from high school, then another orphanage in Washington, D.C., where I attended the Catholic University of America and, and graduated and got my education to have the, the profession that I'm so grateful to have been able to have served at Miami-Dade College and, and other places. But the reason uh, why Mr. Baker... Uh, started this program as he, because when years passed, I went to interview him because I was very concerned about the name Pedro Pan, which does translate into English as Peter Pan, which the connotation of that is sort of like a flight to fancy of a, of a child who's going to live in the land of boys and fight pirates and win and run into a crocodile. And, and that really, uh, uh, with what I've told you, I'm sure you do not, uh, when you hear the words uh, Peter Pan, there is no connotation about what really happened and the emotion of separating the Cuban families as this program uh, did. And I'm very fortunate and I'll be forever grateful because I escaped Cuba 
and all my family escaped Cuba, but there were many families that did not, that remained separated uh, throughout uh, many years. I went and interviewed Mr. Baker when he was an older uh, person. He was living in, um, in um, Smyrna Beach and teaching there at the community college. And I said, Mr. Baker, why, why has this happened? He says, well, I really don't know either, Celia. I don't understand why this name is the one that has become popular to define this uh, movement of unaccompanied children of over 14,000 who left Cuba. I think it's the second or third largest massive exodus in the history of unaccompanied children leaving uh, uh, any country. And I'm sure that many of you have been seeing TV and coverage of Syrian refugees and, and all other uh, na natural phenomena whereby there are max exodus from countries escaping communism, escaping famine, escaping war, escaping terror. And you may think that our exit from Cuba was, um, <laughs> was not as dramatic, but it was terrifying. There was a great deal of fear, a great deal of uncertainty for us, the ones who were experiencing it. And Mr. Baker said he did this, uh, uh, he established these contacts and, and started this program in Cuba because uh, the parent of one of the children in the school had started anti-revolutionary activities against Castro. And he approached Mr. Baker and said, Mr. Baker, I'm so worried, my, my, my son, uh, he's about 12 years old, and I'm so worried that something might happen to me and what's going to happen to him. And with that, his idea, uh, you know, the idea to help this man get his child out of Cuba is what, what was the seed of this movement. And in Cuba, there was a network of people who worked to provide paperwork and legal papers because these, uh, these children were not, were not illegal immigrants as, as you would have them classified. We all had papers, we had visas, and that network uh, was totally illegal in Cuba to obtain these visas for the children. And a number of people who participated in it ended up uh, in jail, among them Polita Grau and, and her brother. And uh, it, it was a, a difficult thing to do. But in any event, he said to me, Celia, this program should be known as the program to save Cuban children from communism. And if you hear this name, it gives uh, this whole thing, the, the, the courage that parents had to have to separate themselves from the ch their children, the courage that Mr. Baker commented on, on the courage that the Cuban children demonstrated once here alone, and yet they, they behaved, you know, according to their education and value system uh, to try to further their education, to work hard and succeed. And um, I don't want to go beyond the time allotted, but because of this program, uh, in spite of whatever hardships I, I may have endured and my brother endured, uh, I am forever grateful to Mr. Baker for having given me the opportunity to live in freedom. And I'm forever grateful to the United States government for helping to support uh, us through their funding. And I'm forever grateful for my, for my parents particularly my mother, who practically be lost her mind when she had to live a year and a half without me and my brother being, you know, uh, in Cuba. So um, this remains um, as uh, an event in my life history that I, I, I don't dwell upon it, but that I believe any opportunity that I have to set the record straight and if, I, if you take a message from my remarks today, it would be that this was a program to save Cuban children from communism, and thus why things happened as they happened. So thank you very much. I know how the name Pedro Pan uh, was created. Uh, it was first um, used by Jean Miller, 
who was a reporter for the Miami Herald. And um, he, um, I think the story first appeared in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, that newspaper. And it was a reporter that was traveling with a group of children uh, in the airplane. And then he wrote about this. And he said, well, maybe this should be called Operation Peter Pan, or better still, Operation Pedro Pan. And the name stuck. It was Jim Miller, the reporter of the Miami Herald, and the name stuck. It, I, I don't think it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's a cute name, and I don't think it really fits what we went through, but that's the way it is, <laughs> right? So that's how we're known. And uh, in my case, uh, Celia, I lived, I didn't leave until September of 1961. So unfortunately, I was, I lived through uh, a lot of what the communist government did uh, in Cuba. And that reinforced my parents' uh, desire to send my sister and I away. I was 13, year, 13 years old and my sister was eight. Uh, we lived through the repression, through the, the, the lack of freedom of expression. Uh, our schools, my sister and I attended the same parochial Catholic schools since kindergarten. She was eight, I was 13. Our schools were closed. The nuns had, were forced to leave the, uh, Cuba. The rest of the nuns in the other Catholic schools were forced to leave Cuba. The priests, most of the priests, the ones that we knew were forced to leave Cuba. And it got to a point where our parents couldn't send us to school because in the, in the government schools, in the public schools, they were teaching communism. They were indoctrinating the children. So there was no school that our parents could send us to. So I think that was what, that was the last straw. That's what made our parents say, we have to get them out of here. And also there's another thing that, is, that we should know. A lot of the people in Cuba, a lot of the parents thought that we would be coming back to Cuba soon because most of the people didn't think that Castro would last, last in Cuba long. And look what happened. It. So it was, not like, it was not a thing that we're sending them away and if we can't leave, we'll never see them again. A lot, a lot of them thought you know, we're convinced that, well, this will pass. They'll start going to school there. Uh, they'll uh, continue their education. And then when everything is normal in Cuba, you know, they'll come back. And that didn't happen. Most of the parents did reunite with their children. My sister and I were lucky. It was nine months only. I know Pedro Pans, who had to wait four or five years. But eventually, most of them did reunite with their parents. Uh, I was, uh, I, uh, when I arrived in September 1961, I stayed in a camp in Miami in the Kendall area. We stayed there for seven days. Mm -hmm. Then we were uh, moved, we were sent to uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, to uh, an orphanage. And I say that the first words in English that I learned were with a Polish accent because all the nuns in that orphanage were Polish. The first thing that I learned was to say, well, I learned something in Polish, which, which was Tak siostra, which means yes, sister in Polish, <laughs> right? And then we were there two months, and then we were transferred to a foster home. And then in the foster home, we were there seven months. And then finally, we were able to come back to Miami and reunite with our parents. As you can imagine, you know, I'm, I won't get into details right now. Maybe after my other two colleagues speak, I will be able to get into more details. But life in the, in the orphanage was not easy. Um, uh, all the children there, uh, most of them had never had a family before. They didn't, uh, you know, we couldn't relate. Um, one of the nuns was very nice to me. Um, she used to give me English lessons after dinner every night. My, my sister and I were separated. She was in one floor, I was in another floor. My sister has other stories to tell. And, um, in the, in the foster home, things, the, the family was very nice, very proper, very decent, but there was kind of friction. Um, you know, I didn't feel like I really belonged there. They had a daughter that was one year younger than I, and we were in competition for grades, for friends and things like that. So, you know, it, it was, um, 
it was it was not that easy. But in the elementary school that I attended, everybody was very nice to me. Again, my sister has other stories to tell, uh, but uh, in general, I again I just wanted to close by saying that I am very happy, very thankful to my parents for having made the decision, because look what's happening in Cuba now. And I'm very thankful to the United States of America for having made possible uh, our, our coming here. They funded the entire program. Uh, they, they, um, they provided us with the visa waivers. I'm very thankful to uh, Mr. Baker, one of my best friends, Susana Gomez, who lives in Washington, she was met at the airport by James Baker. And James Baker, she, yeah, he did at the beginning go to the airport a lot in Miami to meet the Pedro Pan children. And he also was one of the first foster parents here in Miami. And I'm also very thankful to the Catholic Church because they also administered the program. So this is all I'm gonna say right now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Fermin and uh, Gloria, Tania, Miguel, uh, Daniel, my wife Fanny. I've been married for 43 years, and so we still talk to each other. Uh, <laughs> uh, I came, I was born in Cuba in 1949, and I came uh, on July 24th, 1962, with the uh, Pedro Pan operation. I uh, came to a camp, uh, Camp Matecumbe, here in Miami. <laughs> And then I was sent to Camp Florida City. Uh, about a year later, I was sent to a foster home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was uh, fortunate to be with an American family that had six kids of their own who spoke no Spanish, so I learned English pretty fast. Uh, I actually had a very nice experience. About three and a half years later, my parents, uh, uh, we, we were reunited. We moved to New Jersey, uh, went in the Army, came back, got married, had a daughter and a son, graduated Rutgers University, and uh, we moved to Miami about 15 years ago. We're happy to be here, away from the cold. I'm grateful to my parents for sending me out of Cuba, and I'm grateful to the United States for taking us in. Thank you. I think that the, the main credit uh, belongs to our parents. I don't think uh, I could have done it. Uh, I had three kids of my own, and uh, I don't think I could have uh, been separated from them. And they were very brave. Uh, I think back on the decision. I was 14 at the time, and uh, my father had a friend in Havana. I was not in Havana. I was where the action was, in Santi Espiritus, right in the middle of the island. I saw um, Batista fall. I saw the rebels come in, I saw the planes go over me, the bombs, the shots, I saw it all. And then two years later, the, the friend that my father had in Havana said, you know, I sent my son, my only son, to the United States. He lives currently in New Mexico with, uh, with an, an American family, foster home, and uh, I want you to send uh, your son uh, to the United States. Um, so for me, it was an adventure, you know, it was, but, on the other hand, I saw it coming. The schools were closed. Uh, the indoctrination programs were, were set. I grew up with uh, a first cousin that I never saw again. <coughs> so uh, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate. Uh, I stayed here for four days. It was right in, during the weekend of the Bay of Pigs. So imagine how Miami was. And uh, I was, Matacumbe was not open yet. It was Kendall Hospital, the old Kendall Hospital. I stayed there for days and uh, they asked for volunteers for Orlando. I said, Orlando, that's close to Cuba. I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I stayed there for eight months. It was a summer camp in April, not too bad. But then they closed that camp in October of 1961 and they sent us to Jacksonville, Camp St. John's. And that was right next to the river in the middle of the winter. And the temperature got down to 17 degrees one day. So it wasn't fun. We, I was there with about 60 other kids, uh, all kinds of personalities, or you can imagine. Uh, they were all boys. And um, in 1962, in June of 1962, they closed the camps. They said, no, we have to close. 
and um, we were sent uh, to a foster home. I was very fortunate. I, I was uh, sent to a foster home in Winter Haven, right near Lakeland. Um, it was a beautiful family, Irish, uh, Irish Catholics. And their kids were grown up. And um, um, one of the uh, high points of my career was to, to witness in um, Mrs. Lonnie's um, uh, funeral. I said, uh, the Lonnie's did not read the gospel. The Lonnie's lived the gospel because they actually took two of us in where their older friends at the parish used to say, you're crazy, how can you take in two Cuban teenagers who spoke no English, et cetera. Um, 15 months later, I reunited with my, my parents. Uh, some of my friends never did. And uh, the rest is history. I stay here. I was fortunate to, um, to go to the university. And of course, Miami Day College is the place, North Campus. The only game in town at that time, then UM, and finally FIU. But I want to give credit to an individual that has, been, um, has not been mentioned today, and that is Monsignor, Monsignor Brian Walsh. Monsignor Brian Walsh ran Catholic Welfare Bureau at that time in Miami, and he was the one that united with Mr. Baker and, and the State Department uh, was one uh, of the main f pillars of the operation. And, uh, and he was the one that protected us here and, and, and took care of us. Um, just wanted to finish by saying that I think uh, most of all has done very well. The record speaks for itself. Could I say something about Monsignor? I was very fortunate to have met Monsignor Walsh also. And I can say, and I, I have seen, there are, are interviews with him uh, on, online. And um, I have interviewed people that I used to work with him. And his main thing was to take care of the children here. So, I, I, yes, I do agree with Julio that he also was a very special person for all of us, um, Pedro Pans you know, in addition to Mr. Baker, right? I would also like to add to that that my failure to mention Monsignor Walsh uh, it was not intentional. I was sure others would, would speak about him. And, um, and it is true that he coordinated the program here. And, um, and then it is true that the association that was formed of former uh, Pedro Pans is very much uh, integrated with the Catholic Church and uh, helping Catholic schools and helping helping children, etc. Uh, but the issue is that I wanted to stress the other side of this story, because Ruston Academy in Cuba was a lay, non-denominational school open to all faiths, and and Mr. Baker himself was an Episcopalian, I believe. And it is important in the story to also give importance to this side of, of that particular experience, <laughs> that this was not strictly a Catholic church program or movement, mm -hmm. that the United States government, that other churches, uh, and that uh, uh, the, the intent of Mr. Baker, as it was always in his, in his school, was to deal with uh, the freedoms we have now guaranteed in our, you know, in our Bill of Rights, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. So it wasn't a strictly a Catholic Church uh, phenomena. And that's why yes. I, I did not stress it. I figured others would. And I want to make sure that that message gets across. There is an interview with Polita Grau, one of the ladies that was instrumental in distributing the visa waivers in Cuba, who landed in jail with her brother because of many things that they did uh, in Cuba, including the Pedro Pan Exodus. But anyhow, there's an interview with her, which FIU has online, and she specifies that there was a group of women that used to go all over Cuba, reaching out, telling, you know, seeing who were the children whose parents wanted to bring them out of Cuba. And they reached out to all children, regardless of religion, uh, 
class of society. Um, so it, as it, a was, it was fact, something that, yeah. As yeah. a matter of fact, there was a group of Jewish yes. children that came with Pedro Pan. Yes, Jewish uh, and, and Protestant children. Uh, I think there's also a very important um, component of this whole program and the experience of many. And it was that we were motivated and we were supported in making sure that we got educated. In other words, that um, when we left in Cuba, we left all our material possessions in Cuba, but the education that we brought with us and the education that we furthered while we were here was, I think, uh, uh, something that we have to be very grateful about also. That that was, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Baker from his point of view, the Catholic Church's emphasis on education, all the other denominations also had that emphasis. That this is a very important value. And uh, secondly, um, that in spite of uh, all the hardships, the lack of material things, uh, separation from uh, our country, et cetera, uh, the whole experience of the Castro government of separating the Cuban family, be it those of us who were in this program or many others who, have, who, who to this day live with separated families is I think um, just as much an atrocity as uh, anything else that I can think of. Bueno, as a moderator, I want to clarify something, <laughs> <laughs> which I said and did it then. I, um, um, in Cuba, the belief was that uh, the regime wouldn't last too long. There were, you are students at Miami, they, there were two treaties. I mentioned one, the Rio de Janeiro Treaty, 1938. No communist system would be permitted in this hemisphere. And then there was also the Platt Amendment, who was, which was not a treaty, it was American policy of practically controlling, you know, Cuban relations with other countries. Just have that in mind because what happened in 55 years ago is happening again. If you don't know history, you won't be able to prevent a lot of things and maybe um, understand them. When you take a look at what is happening in Syria, uh, it's happening to us here. Uh, thousands of people coming uh, through the frontier. I'm, I'm, I'm not taking any sides. I'm, my heart goes for those poor people. I'm, after all, I went through something like that, or my people have. At the same time, you have issues of national security. And that's why you should come out from this class. You, you follow what I'm saying? What? What is going to happen? In an overcrowded world, um, and you have a totalitarian system. Totalitarian system have simple questions, simple answers. And then this country, where practically anybody can become a minority. Um, minority was a term used in the Constitution for the party that lost an election. Now it is a sexual orientation, it is a, a gender orient You follow what I'm saying? And uh, just think about it, because um, if we lose this democracy, which is an orchid, it'll never come back. It has never flourished anywhere in the world, except here and in France. I want to thank you for attending this program. Um, I think uh, all of us learn a little bit from it. And um, um, whatever um, learning we get from it is that people are always going to search for freedom. And that not everybody has um, the, vaya, la suerte en español, <laughs> as lucky as, uh, these people were, these kids were, and uh, democracy ought to be fought for at any cost. We all are looking for democracy all over the world. Let's take good care of it, and thank you.